It's uh, Peter Van Geldern calling from the BIA Bridgeport studio. Uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. I have a, uh, a death in my family, so I, I have to take care of that. But I did want to join you at your conference and contribute what I can. Uh, myself, I, I uh, am very interested in a culture of engagement. So that's what I want to talk about today. It's obviously related to branding and marketing, but I don't use those words. I use the word engagement. And uh, so I just wanted to go through this uh, Prezi presentation and share some videos with you within the, within the uh, presentation to uh, give you a concept of where my thinking's at and how I'm helping at BIA and also at University of Bridgeport and also at Barrytown College. So uh, let me get started and I'll just uh, move right along. I'll try to keep this to about 45 minutes. So uh, again, you know, how, do, how are we teaching, how are we growing, how are we branding our name, getting out there uh, is the point of this particular seminar. And uh, just a little bit about me, uh, myself, I'm, uh, I'm now teaching at uh, the University of Bridgeport as a professor and we're teaching broadcast television and film and news. So kind of production 101 stuff but more news orientated. And we're looking to develop programs there with the students, uh, like a channel, like our own network, so that UB can constantly put out the word, put out the message, promote its culture. So this is how I'm going about it, is building a studio and uh, creating content. So uh, I'm also at Barrytown College teaching like filmmaking 101, especially documentary filmmaking, because I'm really interested in storytelling. And uh, storytelling is a powerful tool to communicate our culture and build our culture. And then I'm at, of course, BIA, which I have been for four years now, uh, developing this media arts program with high school students. And I call this program uh, Digital Arts or Digital Literacy. So it's a form of literacy that the children are using to empower themselves and communicate better, com communicate concepts, share ideas, and get out into the world with this new skill and new vocabulary that they're going to need. So uh, I have a video about my journey in the uh, unification movement and my professional journey uh, over the last decade or so, which has to do with you know how I develop these concepts. Uh, if there's time, let's watch it. I'm so grateful for my amazing family. It has been quite a journey. I was born in 1964 on December 31st. Officially, I'm one of the last baby boomers. I was born in a hippie family in Westchester, New York, and my mom's a New Age healer, my dad's a born-again Christian. Like my dad, I went to school for architecture and found my way to London there I studied a very good school, the Architectural Association, and I became a Quaker. I was drawn to the Quakers because they use a very non-hierarchical system. In stark contrast to the Quakers, I joined the Unification Movement in 1989. It was quite an experience. Being someone with a very diverse background, Unificationism was very compelling to me also. Life picked up speed and I traveled around Europe with the movement and found ourselves in Berlin. Not only in Berlin, but in Berlin when the wall fell. It was a very historical time and a very historical experience. It's amazing to see the power of change and how quick it can happen. A few years supporting the movement and I found myself in Seoul, Korea, getting married to Joan Sirwald, now Joan Van Geldern. 30,000 couples all together, wow, making vows to become citizens of peace. The people we were married with at that time are our deepest and longest friends to date. Our honeymoon was actually in North Korea, where 100 couples were chosen to fly to uh, Pyongyang and then travel around the country, including True Father's house and True Mother's hometown. 
I'll never forget North Korea and how unique it was and how different it is from the free world that I live in. After all those experiences, I felt like myself and my family would be a bridge to this new world of peace that we've been working so hard for. I found myself in New York. Being a bridge personality, my wife and I developed a coffee shop right in 43rd Street headquarters. Since it was right on Fifth Avenue, I couldn't let that go to waste. And I wanted to use my architectural skills to contribute, but didn't stop there. I designed houses for East Garden, the True Family. I've done hundreds of production events with very talented people, including my very close friend, Simon Kinney. Together, along with hundreds of committed members, we created events at a scale that's unbelievable. One of the largest events on the mall in Washington, D.C. I was the head designer for Madison Square Garden, blessing in 1998. These are very large events, and I learned a lot. As our confidence and skill set grew, we decided to set out and develop our own creative agency in downtown Manhattan. We were fortunate enough to be part of the whole dot-com boom and saw companies like Google develop from their infancy. At this point, I really started to get into the concept of networking and supporting people for their talent. Idea agents did just that. Unfortunately, in the tragedy of 9-11, the world changed rapidly. We became recommitted to a different focus, one of sustainability. I moved into the sustainable architecture field and developed several companies that were committed to rethinking the way we treated the earth and each other. Shades of Green Network was a green economy network set up to support a grassroots community of entrepreneurs and green professionals. I continued to work in the field of green architecture and had many commissions to sharpen my sword in this new field. Eventually I joined up with my partner Robert Lockwood in a company called Princeton Green. Princeton Green had attached an economic model to the network model of Shades of Green Network. Robert and I went on to write a book called Regenerating America. It's about a new kind of entrepreneur, an expansive entrepreneur that focuses on his consciousness as well as his business skills. The book is out this year, 2013. I hope you get to take a look at it. After a difficult economic time in 2008, I was fortunate enough to land on my feet at BIA. Working with my family and my wife as a teacher has been amazing. While at BIA, I've been able to develop a whole new digital arts program, promoting digital literacy in the 21st century. MSG Varsity has been a big part of the growth of our department at BIA. They have given us training, computers, support, and helping 600 schools around the tri-state area. Their network model is amazing, and I've integrated a lot of the things into my philosophy on how we can build our own empowering grassroots network model. So I really want to start here. Starting here, for me, is asking the right question. The question is, what is education? So I, I found myself coming from a field of architecture and production, really becoming an edu educator and a mentor. So this is where I'm at now in my career. And uh, so being an, being an innovator, being an entrepreneur, I, I train myself to ask good questions when we're in a startup mode. So for me, I always ask that big question, what is education and are we educating? So I'd like to just uh, go over kind of where I built my educational philosophy. And again, I, I run my class like a lab, so I, I'm not exactly like all educators, so I don't expect people to follow my model, but I think there should be a good blend uh, between what I do and what you do, and uh, you know, 80-20 maybe percent, 20% uh, this lab stuff and, and some of these philosophies, and as we migrate towards a whole new paradigm in education. 
And so the new landscape of education is what Seth Godin's talking about. So let's watch this film together. It's a film about 17 minutes. This is a TED Talk, so this is kind of the meat and potatoes. And uh, let's go through this, and then I'll come back in. Good morning, boys and girls. That was terrible. You've learned how to do that from a young age. You're supposed to say, good morning, Mr. Godin. So let's try again. Good morning, boys and girls. Have you thought about what that's for? Have you thought about how for 100 or 150 years that was ingrained into the process of public education? Have you thought at all, as people on the cutting edge, as people who are interested in making school work again, about a very simple question? What is school for? I don't think we're answering that question. I don't even think we're asking that question. Everyone seems to think they know what school is for, but we're not going to make anything happen until we can all agree about how we got here and where we're going. So my goal today is to put that question into your head and help you think about it. First, we have to understand what school used to be for. There's a woman named Mary Yvette Boole, and she came up with this notion, she was a mathematician in the late 1800s, that you could use string and nails and wood and make decorations, those things where the string goes back and forth, and there's math built into that. And that a teacher on the cutting edge of fifth graders might decide to use that idea of modulo nine and remainders and string going back and forth to teach an important lesson about math. So the memo went home to all the parents at my kid's public school, and it said, we need help with this, we need hammers. So I'm sort of unemployed, I showed up at school that day with a bag of hammers, a big bag of 18 hammers. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard 18 kids hitting nails with 18 <laughs> hammers in a little room for 20 minutes, but I have. And I'm not going to do it for you because it's really hard to listen to. And what the teacher explained to the kids is, they must arrange the brads in this certain pattern, hammering, 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 and make sure they're in there nice and firm. And so these kids are hammering, 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 20 minutes of zero education, just 20 minutes of hammering. And then the teacher walks over and she says to a boy, I told you to make sure that brads were all the way in. And one by one, she pulled them out and threw them on the floor, every single one and put the board down, and that is what she believed school was for. School was about teaching obedience. Good morning, boys and girls, starts the day with respect and obedience. Now we have to move on to Frederick J. Kelly. Some of you brought your own number two pencil for the quiz that's going to be part of today. The number two pencil is famous because Frederick J. Kelly made it famous. Back around World War I, we had a problem, which was this huge influx of students, because we had expanded the school day to include high school. And there was this huge need to sort them all out. So he invented the standardized test, an abomination. And he gave it up 10 years later when the emergency was over. But because he gave it up, because he called it out, because he said the standardized test is too crude to be used, he was ostracized and lost his job as the president of a university because he dared to speak up against a system that was working. So let's try a little experiment here. I'd like everyone to go ahead and raise your right hand just as high as you possibly can. Now please raise it a little higher. Hmm, what's that about? <laughs> My instructions were pretty clear, and yet you all held back. How come? You held back because you've been taught since you were three years old to hold a little bit back. Because if you do everything, if you put all out, then your parent or your teacher or your coach or your boss is going to ask for a little bit more, aren't they? <laughs> and the reason they will is because we are products of the industrial age. The industrial age made us all rich. The industrial age brought productivity to the table. Productivity allows human beings working together with a boss and a manager to make more than they could ever make alone. Productivity makes us a car for $700 instead of $700,000 in 1920. But the thing about productivity and industrialism is this. 
the people who ran factories had two huge problems. Problem number one, they looked around and they said, we don't have enough workers. We don't have enough people who are willing to move off the farm and come to this dark building for 12 hours a day, six days a week, and do what they are told. If we could get more workers, we could pay them less. And if we could pay them less, we'd make more money. We need more workers. And so, the KKK went to industrialists and said, you need to get those kids out of the factories, those people you're paying $3 a day, because they're taking our jobs. And so a deal was made. And the deal was universal public education whose sole intent was not to train the scholars of tomorrow. We had plenty of scholars. It was to train people to be willing to work in the factory. It was to train people to behave, to comply, to fit in. We process you for a whole year. If you are defective, we hold you back and process you again. We sit you in straight rows, just like they organize things in the factory. We build a system all about interchangeable people. Because factories are based on interchangeable parts. If this piece is no good, put another piece in there. And org charts, those little boxes, are all designed to say, oh, we can fit Bob in there because Rachel didn't go to work today. And so we built school. That's what school was for. And the second thing industrialists were really worried about was that we weren't going to buy all the stuff they could make. That in 1880, 1890, people owned two pairs of shoes, one pair of jeans. That was it. Right? You don't know anyone who owns one pair of jeans anymore, ever. What they needed to train us to do was buy stuff. They needed to train us to fit in. They needed to train us to become consumers. And so Horace Mann, who meant well, built the public school as we know it. And then he needed a, more teachers, right? Because you have more schools. So he built a school for teachers. You know what it's called? The normal school. He called it the normal school, where they trained people to teach in the common school, because he wanted you to be normal. And he wanted the class to be normal. And he wanted people to fit in. And then we came up with this, the textbook. Now, if you want to teach somebody how to become passionate about, I don't know, American history, why would you give them this? <laughs> Do people walk into Barnes & Noble and say, I'm really interested in that latest gripping thing that's going to get me all engaged about the Civil War. Do you have one of those textbooks in stock? If you wanted to teach someone how to be a baseball fan, would you start by having them understand the history of baseball and who Abner Doubleday was and what barnstorming was and the influences of cricket and capitalism and the Negro Leagues. Would you do that? Would you say, okay, there's a test tomorrow. I want you to memorize the top 50 batters in order by batting average and then rank the people based on how they do on the test so the ones who do well get to memorize more baseball players? Is that how we would create baseball fans? Here's the key distinction. What people do, quite naturally, is if it's work, they try to figure out how to do less. And if it's art, we try to figure out how to do more. And when we put kids in the factory we call school, the thing we built to indoctrinate them into compliance, why are we surprised that the question is, will this be on the test? Right? Someone who's making art doesn't say, can I do one less canvas this month? They don't say, can I write one less song this month? They don't say, can I touch one, less, one fewer person this month? It's art. They want to do more of it. But when it's work, when it's your job, when you're seven, of course you want to do less of it. So one of the things that I've done as an uh, avocation is I, when I meet people, I take this out, this is a great bargain online. And it's filled with these blocks, right? You've probably seen blocks before. I'm going to dump it out a little bit. And I say, take four blocks and make them into something interesting. Now, it's an interesting question, because you can use the letters, or you can use the shapes. You can spell a word. You can put a profanity there. You can spell a word that means nothing. You can make the shape into a bridge. And people hate this, because there's no right answer, and there's a million wrong answers. They hate this because there's no dummy's guide to how to make something interesting out of blocks when you're 30 years old. And now we're at a crossroads. 
we're at a crossroads because as a culture, we say the only thing we care about, the only place we're willing to cross the street to go, the only thing we're willing to buy, the only person we're willing to vote for, the only stuff we're willing to talk about is interesting, is art, is new, will touch us, is valuable. And then we spend all of our money and all of our time teaching people not to do that. And so we're now at this crossroads because technology is here too. And the technology says, you know what? For the first time in history, we do not need a human being to stand next to us to teach us to do square roots. For the first time in history, we do not need a human being to teach us how to sharpen an ax because the internet connects us all. And so I want to share with you eight things that I think are going to change completely if we decide how we want to answer this question, or maybe even if we don't. One, as Sal Khan has pointed out, homework during the day, lectures at night. World-class lecturers lecturing on anything you want to learn to every single person in the world who's got an internet connection for free. And then all day, go and sit with a human being, a teacher, and ask your questions and do your work and explore face to face. It's stupid to have the same lecture being given, handmade, 10,000 times a day across the country when we can get one person to do it great for the people who want to hear it. Number two, open book, open note all the time. There is zero value in memorizing anything ever again. Anything that is worth memorizing is worth looking up. So we shouldn't spend any time teaching people to memorize stuff. Number three, access to any course anywhere in the world anytime you want to take it. So this notion that we have to do things in a certain order, which is based on physical location and chronology, makes no sense. Number four, precise, focused education instead of mass batch stuff. That's the way we make almost everything we buy now, right? It used to be you could have any color car you want as long as it was black, so we could keep the assembly line going. But now, they make 10,000 kinds of cars, because they can, so we should make 10,000 kinds of education. No more multiple choice exams. Those were invented to make them easy to score, but computers are smarter than that. Measuring experience instead of test scores, because experience is what we really care about. The end of compliance as an outcome. The resume is, a, is proof that you have complied for years and years and years with famous brand names, and it gets you your next job. It's worthless now. And cooperation instead of isolation. Why do we do anything where we ask people to do it all by themselves when then we put them in the real world and say, cooperate? Four more, teacher's role transforms into coach, lifelong learning with work happening earlier in your life, and really important, the death of the famous college. Not good college, we don't know what a good college is, but we know what a famous college is, because someone ranked them as famous, or because they have a football team that's famous. Why on earth are we paying extra? Why on earth are we working harder to comply and be obedient just so we can get a famous brand name that has no relevance to success or happiness put after our name? I want to show you one more device I have over here as I start to do this. this it's called an Arduino, and it's a little bit like a Raspberry Pi. They're both electronic devices that cost $20 to $30 each. Raspberry Pi, which you can buy for $25, has on it the complete Linux operating system, a USB port, audio out, and a monitor. So if we take that cable and that keyboard and that monitor we already have in front of almost every kid in this country and hand them one of these, we can then say to them, go build something interesting and ask if you need help. Why wouldn't we want to teach our kids to go do something interesting? Why wouldn't we want to teach our kids to figure it out? And yet, every day we send kids to school and say, do not figure it out. Do not ask questions I do not know the answer to. Do not look it up. Do not vary from the curriculum. And better, 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 comply. Fit in. Be like your peers. Do what you're told, because I must process you, because everything in my uh, evaluation is based on whether or not I processed you properly. So there are two myths I want to close with. The first one, and we got to be really honest with ourselves about this, myth one, great performance in school leads to happiness and success. If that's not true, we should stop telling ourselves it is. 
And two, great parents have kids who produce great performance in school. If that's not true, we should stop telling ourselves it is. Are we asking our kids to collect dots or connect dots? Because we're really good at measuring how many dots they collect, how many facts they have memorized, how many boxes they have filled in. But we teach nothing about how to connect those dots. You cannot teach connecting dots in a dummy's manual. You cannot teach connecting dots in a textbook. You can only do it by putting kids into a situation where they can fail. Grades are an illusion. Passion and insight are reality. Your work is more important than your congruence to an answer key. Persistence in the face of a skeptical authority figure is priceless, and yet we undermine it. Fitting in is a short-term strategy that gets you nowhere. Standing out is a long-term strategy that takes guts and produces results. If you care enough about your work to be willing to be criticized for it, then you have done a good day's work. So what now? What now? What should we do? Because we've been talking about it a whole lot. Only one thing. Ask the question. What is school for? When they say, this is our new textbook, the question is, is that going to help us with getting what school is for. When they say this is the new superintendent, we need to say, yes, but is this superintendent going to help us do what we think school is for? And if you don't know what school is for, then have a conversation about it. Because until we can agree what school is for, we're not going to get what we need. Thank you for the work you do. I appreciate it. So the next topic I want to talk about is how we connect. We really connect as humans at any level when we're learning, you know, the human species. So in my class, I have some reading, required reading, which I call uh, the storytelling animal. So how stories make us human. So what I've learned is that uh, beyond just education or words or ideas, we are wired for storytelling. We react, we grow, we, we, we absorb through stories. And stories are what we remember. So I'm a big advocate as we talk about branding and marketing is really this storytelling part of it is tell your story. Tell the story over and over again. Share your culture, that you're, what you're doing and who you're connected to and why you're doing it and why it's great. So. Uh, we're going to just watch this little film. It's only uh, a few minutes, and this is about his book a little bit and how important storytelling is. Let's take a look. Statisticians believe they could get a monkey to type Hamlet if they could only convince one to randomly thwack a typewriter for a long, long time. But a monkey already wrote Hamlet, or at least a great ape did. And long before any of these apes thought of writing Hamlet or Harlequins or Harry Potter stories, they thronged around hearth fires trading wild lies about brave tricksters and young lovers, selfless heroes and shrewd hunters, sad chiefs and wise crones, the origin of the sun and the stars, the nature of gods and spirits, and all the rest of it. Now, tens of thousands of years later, most of us still hew strongly to myths about the origins of things and we still thrill to an astonishing multitude of fictions on pages, on stages, and on screens. Murder stories, sex stories, war stories, conspiracy stories, true stories and false. We are, as a species, addicted to story. Why? Why do we live in fiction? How do we become the storytelling animal? So the next little video, real short again, just a couple minutes, let's look at uh, how businesses are using storytelling. Don't you love a great story? I mean, think about it. When is the last time you were in a room and you heard a really great story and it was just like, oh, I love that. Well, think about it. That same experience can be done in business. And yet, for some reason, we think we have to be so informational. And one point, two point, three point. Except there are great stories to tell and do business. Now, why is that so important? What is the power of storytelling? 
Well, one, I think that people remember the way that you made them feel, not just the words that you actually said. So when you tell a great story, people loved and it has an impact on them, then they go and they tell somebody else and they tell somebody else and they tell somebody else and they remember so that when they see you in a networking event six months from now, they're gonna be like, oh my goodness, that story that you told me when your company almost ran out of cash and then you had this loan and then boom, now you're huge, I love that story. It's amazing. Now the second thing is when you tell a great story, you're actually sharing a bit of you. It's not just about the business, which is this thing outside of you. It's who you, it's something that happened to you. And we love a connection with a person, not just with a brand, not just with a logo, not just with a product. We want to see the person behind the business, behind the product. That's who we become loyal to. We love that person. I mean, I even think people who admire Virgin, they know Richard Branson, man. They're excited about him, so they're loyal to his brands. Steve Jobs is another great example. So don't be afraid to insert yourself and your great stories into your business communication because that's who people are truly loyal to. And the third point is, is that if you've got a great story, begin with your story and then from the story, weave in those information points that you really want to convey. And you can also reiterate them after the story is over. But when you think about those great business stories or personal stories that you can use in business, all of your information points are already inside, but you have to mind for them to let it reinforce maybe what you learned, what you experienced, how that influences your business or is a metaphor for your business. Because let's face it, stories are awesome. Information, the kind of interest level is here, but stories give you, give you the opportunity to be inspirational. So when you have a choice to give information or to inspire your audience, always inspire your audience with a fabulous story. Believe me, they'll thank you for it. Okay, so we talked about storytelling, we talked about the, the paradigm shift that's happening in education that we should integrate somehow, in my opinion. But uh, you know, the other part is how we learn. I talked about the flipped classroom. So the flipped classroom is a, uh, a new methodology in teaching that I use heavily because I have a lot of production fundamentals that I need to teach my children and my students uh, at every age so that they're not just wasting their time listening to me lecture when they come in. We want to get our hands on the equipment. We want to try stuff. So we use the flipped class and here's a short little animation about the flipped class. It's pretty cool. Every day, 7.2 million students walk into classrooms throughout the United States. These classrooms generally look the same. 30 students sit in rows of desks, taking notes in their notebooks, while the teacher stands at a whiteboard teaching a lesson. Regardless of ability level, each student receives the exact same information at the exact same pace. As Ms. Jackson presents the same material, the students respond differently. Tommy gets it, while Allison is bored, and Maria is lost. At the end of the day, these same students head home. While at home, they sit at the kitchen table doing their homework and trying to remember what Ms. Jackson said. Students like Tommy make it most of the way through the homework, while others, like Allison, find it easy and fly through it. At the same time, students like Maria get frustrated and need some extra help. Ms. Jackson recognizes that students have different needs and would love to work individually with each student, but this requires time and resources that her school does not have. One solution to this problem is the flipped classroom. Here's what it looks like. While at home, students sit in their rooms watching videos of the lesson that Ms. Jackson assigned. Tommy is still able to work at his normal pace. Allison is no longer bored because now she can use this new technology to fast forward through the easy material. And Maria is no longer frustrated because she can review the material that she didn't understand by pausing and rewinding. When she really gets stuck, she can get help from her classmates. New technology platforms like Moodle and Edmodo make it easy for her to chat online with her classmates. Just as the homework is different, the classroom is different as well. Instead of standing in front of the room speaking, Ms. Jackson walks around the room. She checks in with Tommy as he works collaboratively with some students. She pushes Allison further with some more challenging work and she helps Maria with the pieces that she still doesn't quite get. 
In the traditional model, the teacher stands between the students and the knowledge. But with the flipped classroom model, the students have direct access to the knowledge, and the teacher serves as a coach, mentor, and guide, helping the students access this knowledge. The flipped classroom leverages technology in a way that lets both Ms. Jackson and the students make the most of their time and efforts. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how we lead. You know, for, so for me, engagement is a form of leadership. It's a kind of leadership. And uh, leadership is where things happen. So for me, in an education environment, who's your a teacher is a leader, administrators are leaders, we're all leaders at this conference. So how do we engage uh, our, our staff, our students, our community, our uh, stakeholders? So uh, here's a quick little uh, animation that I like of, from Ken Wright, just about the importance of integrating engagement leadership into your organization. Engagement is all about feelings. As Carl Buchner said, people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Engagement is a measure of the team's emotional commitment to their leader, and it's critically important for the bottom line. In America, disengagement costs business over $350 billion a year, and in Australia, $45 billion. Gallup studies show only 30% of people are actively engaged despite all the attention on engagement. Do you really know how engaged your people are? In the engagement surveys I conduct, the average business has about 50% engaged and disengaged in total. This is a leader's first great opportunity. The remaining 50% sitting on the fence waiting for a leader to engage them. I call this the leader's sweet spot. An actively engaged team member is around 30% more productive than a fence sitter and retention is dramatically improved. So it's essential that leaders work this sweet spot. A leader's second opportunity is to disengage people or bad apples. Target them as well. Help them adjust their attitudes or help them find another job. Great leaders have emotional intelligence, but to really drive results and be exceptional, leaders need what I call EQ2, engagement intelligence. EQ2 involves really understanding your people, finding their individual motivators, and working on these hot buttons to improve morale, attitude, and results. In my book, The People Pill, and in my engagement presentations, we cover many strategies a leader can implement immediately. They cost virtually nothing and are guaranteed to make people feel great about themselves, which is a real secret to getting the best out of people and engaging them. Some of these strategies include five-minute desk chats. These are a way to show people you care about them. Mary, what's on for the weekend? Sending out personalized handwritten cards that recognize specific contributions are timely and from the heart. Morning teas to celebrate progress and success stories. Holding a breakfast of champions to acknowledge effort. Pretend people have a banner on their forehead. Make me feel special. Remember, people usually leave leaders, not organizations, and it's the line leader's responsibility for attitude and engagement. I recommend you measure your team engagement and implement strategies like the ones above. Focus on that sweet spot to bring everyone along and create a culture of engagement. It really will change your bottom line and retain and attract the best people. If you think of the best boss you ever had, it'll be someone who helped you believe in yourself, cared about you and developed and inspired you. In other words, they engaged you. Become a master of EQ2 and be the best boss your team ever had. And the next topic is outcomes. How do we create outcomes? Uh, you know, that this is such an important part of education in schools and part of our branding and promotion. So we can shout about how good we are all day. And uh, a lot of schools do. We're great, we're great, we're great. But actually, it's not so effective because people want to measure you and they want to rate you based on peers and what people think and what's going on in reality. And for me, that is measured by outcomes. 
So uh, for me, relationships are the driving force in outcomes. And because we're, we're social animals and we, we need relationships to be better humans. And so here's a little video, uh, sh again, very short about relationships and how that's driving school, the school environment, the education environment, and how we're driving outcomes through that. And then we're going to talk about promoting those outcomes is critical for branding and marketing. the social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to include adults who are family members in childcare centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile-up, the cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity these skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice, but we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? That's a new idea. Buen trabajo. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? 
moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society. It's critical for a thriving business. It's critical for a successful environment of relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. Okay, lastly, I want to talk about is uh, building your brand through engagement. So this is like engagement marketing, engagement branding, engagement education. You know, we are, um, that's, that's the soapbox I'm on today. So, you know, we need to uh, have some of these driving forces in our culture, and then we need to talk about those. We need to tell that story of what we're doing, and that's our identity, and that's who we are, and our stories of engagement will drive our culture and drive our uh, brand in, in the world. People will know us for that. So, you know, we talked about the leadership stuff and training. Here's a couple things from uh, MIT that I integrated into the talk, which is, you know, we need to have great managers and leaders, so we're always looking for those, but we're also training those leaders. Those leaders have to be supported and raised up and appreciated and growing all the time. And their growth and their excellence is really where the engaged teacher comes from, which is an engaged manager, which is really driving the students. So if you have engaged students, it's because you have engaged teachers. And uh, these are actually what, like Harvard and Yale and Princeton, they're all locked into this concept that I'm engaging my faculty and staff first, and that's driving engagement with the students, and then engaged students is where the alumni come back and they stay engaged and they also become the big donors. They become the people that are vested in the college and the brand. And if you don't have that engagement in the beginning, it doesn't happen. And then you lose the whole cycle of uh, endowments, alumni participation, donations, things like that. So uh, we need to drive the culture of engagement from the faculty and staff first. Then. We need to uh, do career and performance development, and then that goes into collaborative community. So I, I'm always talking about integrating the community as well, which is you know bringing in parents and other uh, church leaders and government or le other leadership to come and speak at the school. And that engagement is is the best storytelling brand because they go out and tell your story. They appreciate the fact that you're creating this space for them. So, um, you know, work, atmosphere, lifestyle, life, wellness, the wellness culture, you know, work life and wellness, they call it, in this diagram is really important and that's just kind of obvious. So, for me, I center these all around some, new, some of these new educational models and also the storytelling model. Everything you do in your culture and in your culture of engagement is being driven through storytelling. So let me go over some practical marketing and branding stuff that comes out of this conversation that you can use, get into these practical steps. So very, very important is that, you know, we can do the Facebook, the YouTube, we can do all that stuff, but it's really, that's not the thing. The thing is your culture and, and the engagement in that culture is where the story comes from. So we just want to tell that story all the time. So a couple things I put down, do a consistent newsletter, very important. Just be out there telling people what's going on, report on success, report on all the things that you do as a culture. Propaganda is not a good idea because people smell it right away. People want to be part of the process, they want to be engaged, they want to be part owners. So if you're struggling, you can tell people. If you're uh, you know, just trying to keep up appearances, it's not going to work. Whereas if you're just really trying to do something valuable, people want to be part of it. So the other one is you know, focus on outcomes, what, what the results of your methodologies are. Uh, I'm building YouTube channels to tell this story. So at Barrytown College, we built a YouTube channel. We're starting to build one for UB. 
and the students have a place to put it. It's free, it's easy, and it's easily shared. Okay, last few things are, you know, I'm using citizen journalism where kids are filming with their iPhones, iPads. It doesn't matter, they're out there and they're participating. The quality is amazing right now with these phones, so you can do a good job with some basic production concepts like good lighting and good sound. So uh, we're also working with local access television. We're starting to create our own our own content on local access PSAs about bullying. We're doing our sporting events. We're doing lectures. And we're actually, with UB, we're, we're going to be developing an educational program. Like our educational content will be on public access and our own channel. Uh, students uh, need to participate. They need to share in in the access to the, the media and the things that they're producing. That's where your tribe shares everything. Your, your students are your tribe, your parents are your tribe, your um, faculty, staff, also, um, you know, any stakeholder is your storyteller. And so they get to share content. It can be screened first by staff, but it needs to get out there sharing the culture. Um, you know, also bring your bring your stakeholders into your organization to talk and participate and share because that's the best way for them to be engaged and that engagement drives the story drives the brand and and you can do that through holding events and uh, uh, talks and uh, different things where their talents shine so just remember engagement is the thing that you market it's the story itself so I, uh, I'm very excited to be with you today, even if it's virtual, and also that, you know, I hope we're, as organizations, we're all driving a new culture of engagement or a strong culture of engagement to uh, build our brands, market ourselves, grow our culture. Take care. Have a great day. I hope the workshop goes really well. And please call me if you have any questions about this. Again, my number is 203 278 uh, 6243, or you can have Dr. Spurgeon contact me. He has all my numbers, and uh, we can talk more about your specific situation at your university, school, high school, whatever it is. All right, take care. God bless.